We're good? Oh, they're still praying. Right? Yeah, yeah. Probably 35 minutes in. Probably. I'm live? Yeah. Like, there are thousands of people watching this stuff right now? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so if there's like a sign right here, I could like try to, okay. Anyway, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm not starting the talk yet. I just wanted to make a public service announcement yet again. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to repeat that uh, we are, inshallah, in this community and when we come for salah and lectures and durus, we're going to try to uh, abide by a higher discipline, inshallah. And part of that is that we correct each other and we do so in a respectful, you know, uh, courteous kind of way. Uh, this walkway over here on the side should be kept empty at all times, um, both from the men and the women. And uh, I'm actually not so worried about the, the older gentlemen. It's the teenage boys that come later on and chill there so they can make a quick escape that are a problem. You know, the reason for this entire thing is that people can get around it and get to the prayer comfortably. But when, you know, guys are sitting there kind of blocking the path, then, yeah, exactly, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Totally sorry. Then they have to do all kinds of maneuvers through the rope thingamajig. The other thing is, you know, you guys know here that alhamdulillah we don't have a partition in the masjid. So the men, the men and women's space is actually combined. And so as an added courtesy to our sisters, it's better that you don't sit against the wall. It's better for everybody, unless you're like way up front over here or something, that you don't sit against the wall. And if, especially if you see one of the younger guys sitting against the wall, gently kind of just do that. Or sisters, if you see them and they're looking that way, you can just literally point to them and say that and they'll move. And if I see them, the worst case scenario is I'll call them out and move, but I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But it's better, you know, uh, the, you know, on the one hand, I do want sisters to not be behind a barrier. On the other hand, we do have to respect that we should be facing this way. The, the, you know, the, especially the younger men among us should be facing this way. So it's better not to sit against the wall, not to sit against the wall. That is the public service announcement. And I won't be making it again. So you're going to, if you see somebody doing so, you're quietly going to go gently say in their ear, Ustad wants to leave the hallway empty kind of thing and move them out of the way. Okay, so that's how we're going to help each other out, inshallah. Even for the sisters and when somebody walks in from the main entrance, that space is for them to walk through. And if you're sitting there, then they're going to have to jump over you or do other things that you probably wouldn't want them to risk their life with. So. We get to go. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. قلنا اهبطوا منها جميعا فإما يأتينكم مني هدى فمن تبع هداي فلا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون والذين كفروا وكذبوا بآياتنا أولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد once again everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I have uh, two tasks before me through the course of this hour my job in the first half of this hour is to try to wrap up discussions, some insights, some reflections on the last two ayat of the story of Adam alayhi salam, ayah number 38 and ayah number 39. We did quite a bit of that discussion on 38 yesterday. There are some outstanding things that I'd like to bring to your attention, inshallah. So that'll be done now. And then uh, hopefully wrap up with ayah number 39 as well over the course of this half hour. And then I want to share with you a really beautiful overview. Like we're going to take a step back and look at the entire story once again. And we're going to notice things that we didn't see before 
uh, inshallah ta'ala, and kind of wrap up the entire uh, story before we move forward with the narrative in Surah Al-Baqarah. So the ayah that we were discussing, ayah number 38, Allah says, قُلْ This is what we talked about yesterday. We said, come down from here altogether. فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا That if and when, at all, any guidance whatsoever comes to you, that is especially from me and can only be from me, then whoever were to follow it, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَرُونَ Then there is no fear on them, nor are they the ones that are going to be grieving. I want to start today with this benefit at the end. Allah Azza wa Jal notice in the next ayah you'll see Ulaika Ashabun Nar. What does that mean? I think you can guess. Ulaika Ashabun Nar. Those are the people of fire. So fire is which is hell is typically contrasted with what in the Quran? With Jannah. Right? But there's no Ulaika Ashabul Jannah hum fiha khalidun and then Ulaika Ashabun Nar hum fiha khalidun. That's not what happens in these two ayat. In fact, what happens in these ayat is whoever follows my guidance. The benefit at the end, instead of saying Jannah, Allah said something else. Allah said the benefit is what's in Arabic, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. And the consequence of the opposite, instead of saying anything else, He said أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون. Those are the people of fire in which they'll remain. So there's an interesting contrast. Instead of talking about heaven, instead of talking about Jannah, Allah talked about actually one of the most powerful qualities of Jannah. And one that actually, in, in saying the way he said it, extended it to this world and to the next. There's a little glimpse of Jannah that you can even experience while you're alive here. You can get a taste of it here. Not just in the fruits and the foods that I talked about before, but even within yourself. The tranquility that you'll feel within yourself. There are some things that Allah will re relieve you from, even in this life. And that's what's being alluded to in these ayat. In the phrase, لا خوف عليهم now that translation, once again, a shallow translation of this benefit, those who follow Allah's guidance in any way, shape or form, and may Allah make us of those, yattabi'una ahsanahu, they follow the best of it. They follow the best, and to the best of their ability, right? So that, we pray to Allah that we're of those people. But the mercy of Allah in this ayah is, whoever follows even a glimpse of it, I will start showering them with benefits. Like, Allah is just eager, bonus after bonus, for just showing him some loyalty. Just take some step towards his way. You know, so Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who make struggles in our path, we open up multiple pathways for them. SubhanAllah, there's someone trying to find their way to Allah. They make some struggle towards Allah. Allah says, I will absolutely, absolutely, absolutely guide them to multiple ways. Like they'll have multiple choices in front of them, multiple pathways in life, and all of them I will make them lead back to me. SubhanAllah. That's the gift of Allah to those who show Him even a little bit of eagerness to seek and pursue His guidance. Anyway, this phrase that I'm going to translate in a shallow sort of way, first of all, it, it doesn't even sound like good English when you translate it literally. It says, there is no fear on them, nor is it they that, that shall grieve. There is no fear on them, nor is it they that shall grieve. We'll take a step-by-step -step approach. The first thing is that there are two emotions mentioned here, fear and then grief. Fear and sadness, you can make it easy. Fear and sadness, okay? And Allah made a priority out of fear by mentioning it first, and then He mentioned sadness. And this is important, because human beings are always looking to the future. I'm worried about being late here. I'm worried about preparation for tomorrow. You're worried about what you're going to eat for iftar. There's always something we're thinking about in the future, right? And the future is what is associated with human fears. My fear is things will not work out the way I want them to. My fears are always not about the past, but always about the future. And the future is constantly in front of you and me. It's constantly staring at us in the face. We constantly have to deal with it. As a matter of fact, most of our lives, big or small, we're dealing with fears. When you wake up, you're afraid of missing a prayer. You're afraid of being late to work. You're afraid of, oh, did I, you know, did I forget something? You know, there's small fears. Then there are big fears. Am I going to pass the test? Am I going to do well on the interview? Is, there, is her family going to like me? <laughs> you know, there's those kinds of big, giant fears. You know, there's all kinds of fears in life. There are fears we have for our children, their education, their future. You know, there are fears about, you know, your husband's late from, from work. There are fears, where is he? What would have, would have happened to him? Until you get better news, there's all these thoughts of what's going to happen. And people start playing an entire drama in their heads, you know, of how things are going to play out. So fear is constantly associated with the future. The other emotion that was mentioned was sadness. And sadness is not associated with the future. Guys, don't sit against the wall up front. No, nobody has the wall. Thank you, guys. So, uh, what was I saying? Something about Islam or something? Sadness. sadness. Yeah, sadness. Okay. So, 
So sadness is not associated with the future, rather sadness is associated with what happened in the past. Right? You're sad over the test you failed. You sad, you're sad over how you got yelled at by mom or something. Or you're sad over a friend that you got into an argument with. You're sad over you know, some opportunity that you missed. Man, I should have been there and I would have gotten the job and I didn't even go and you know, that kind of thing. Those, that's, those are moments of sadness. Now the thing is, sadness only comes when you remember what, what happened. A lot of times you go to therapy or friends tell you, ah, forget about what happened, right? let's move on with your life. Think about your future. And there are people who can actually roll with the punches, they get hit a lot, they, get, they go through a lot of tough things in life, and they're able to just put it behind them and keep moving on. But then sometimes, every once in a while, you're reminded of something sad in the past, and it moves you to tears. What I'm trying to get at, the reason I brought up this anecdotal discussion is as follows. Fear is a constant. Fear is a constant. Sadness comes and goes. Because sadness is associated with what? The past. And it only hits you when you remember it when you think about it. When you're not thinking about it, you're thinking about the future, it's not fear that's bothering you, or it's not sadness that's bothering you, it's fear that's bothering you. Now this is remarkable because if you notice from the very base analysis of this phrase, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون, the word خوف that Allah used, there's no fear on them, He used a noun for fear. And a noun is considered permanent, timeless, constant. So Allah used grammatically the constant version of a word for fear, just like fear itself is constant, the noun is constant. And when he talked about sadness, which comes and goes, he used a verb, which is actually, it corresponds to the human sentiment of sadness because we're not always sad. We, we, it hits us, then it goes away, and it hits us, and it goes away. But fears are actually, literally, they are, they are fears that are conscious and subconscious that are constantly driving your actions. Everything from going to work and pursuing your education, you know, there are fears that are driving a lot of these decisions, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal accurately describes what's going on inside the heart and the mind of a human being. What is the constant and what takes priority and what comes and goes. That's the first observation. The second is actually specifically about fear. The strange language that I translate is there is no fear on them. There is no fear on them or there won't be any fear on them. That's not very clear English. And I do that on purpose because Allah says لا خوف عليهم there's no fear, literally, there's no fear on them. I want you to understand from an English point of view. I won't get into Arabic linguistics, but from an English point of view. There's a big difference between they're not afraid and there's no fear on them. There's actually a huge difference. Okay, now I'm, I'm talking about something that happens in Arabic, but I'm going to try to explain it to you in simple English. The two things I'm going to compare are they're not afraid, that's one phrase, and the other phrase is there's no fear on them. I'll give you an example. There's a little girl. She loves playing with toys. Her favorite kind of toy is toy snakes. Now, most people are freaked out by that kind of thing, but this girl is, you know, she's got her thing. And one day she's actually playing. She doesn't even know it's not a toy snake. It's what? It's a real snake. And she's just having fun. It's tickling her neck. It's doing all kinds of... She is not... If you cannot actually say about her as she's laughing and giggling that she is afraid. She's not afraid. But there's certainly a fear on her meaning the parents have a fear for her that she, uh, she is going to get hurt. There's a fear on someone actually means they're in danger and somebody else is feeling concerned for you. Like if a parent says to a child or to a, you know, a young man or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm afraid for you. That's the closest thing in English. I'm afraid for you that you're going to get into an accident if you keep driving this way. You know, there's a real concern over you. There's a fear over you, on you, for you. The idea here would be that somebody else is worried about you. You get it? And they're worried about some real danger. Whether you feel afraid or not, doesn't matter. You're still playing with a snake, kid. You could get bitten. You're actually in danger. Feeling afraid is, may not be a bad thing, actually. Allah describes believers, يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا They're afraid of a day. إِنَّا نَخَافُ مِنْ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْطَرِيرًا We are afraid of a day that is full of great sadness. They're afraid of a day where hearts and minds are, hearts and eyes are going to be flipped over. So Allah Azza wa Jal describes feeling afraid is actually a good thing. But Allah in this ayah is not talking about you feeling afraid. As a matter of fact, on the day of judgment, can you imagine? We are walking, we're not there in heaven yet. Surah Al-Tahreem will describe, Surah Al-Hadid will describe. Believers are walking, Allah has given them light that comes out of their chest and light that comes out of their right hand. They're using this light to see the, through all the darkness and they're making their way into Jannah. 
And as they're walking, do you think they're afraid even a little bit? Yeah, because they're not where yet. They're not in Jannah. And they're, they're nervously begging Allah, Rabbana atmim lana nurana. Master, please complete our light. Waghfir lana. And forgive us. Now they have light. And they're making progress towards heaven. But when would someone say, please forgive us? Please make, make sure the light goes all the way through. Obviously they are what? They're afraid. But then how, does, how do we reconcile? Allah says, those who follow my guidance, there's not going to be any fear on them. Allah is actually saying, even if they will be feeling afraid, and they will be, they will be feeling afraid, there's no real danger on them. There's no real danger on that. Let me give you the contrasting picture so you can put this visual in your mind. That same little girl, somehow you got rid of the snake. And you said, here child, play with the teddy bear instead. And she's terrified. She's crying. She can't look at this thing. Its eyes bulging out at her. She's horrified by the teddy bear. She's totally okay with the snake. And she's terrified of the teddy bear. This time, she's afraid, but there's actually no fear on her, you understand? What's more important? To deny that you won't feel afraid or to make sure there's no fear on you? What do you think is big, bigger priority? Make sure there's no fear on you actually means make sure you're not in any kind of danger. That is the relief Allah offers us in the first phrase, there is no fear on them. You know, that's why there's no, there's, it's alayhim, it's not la khawfun lahum. If it was lahum, it would have been they have no fear. That's even worse. How, why would believers have no fear? They're supposed to have fear. That's one of our most beautiful qualities. So reading the Qur'an, the Qur'an's language carefully becomes very, very important. Then some argue, why isn't it لا عليهم خوف? You know, you could even change the order of words in the Arabic language. لا عليهم خوف. I won't go, again, I won't go into the grammar, but I will tell you what it means in English. It, it would actually mean, they're not the ones on whom there is fear, there's some other people that have fear on them. That would be a terrible meaning, by the way, because that would mean, there's no concern for these people, but rather Allah is concerned for some other people. <laughs> That's not the intent. And if you, even if you like mess with the sequence of this phrase a little bit, its perfection is lost. I'm getting a lot of this from uh, a real inspiration to myself. Uh, Dr. Fadl Salih Hassan al-Rai, in one of his shows, La Masad Bayaniya, he does a show where people, you know, he's a linguist, and people ask him questions, how come Allah says this this way? How come he says it that way? And he just kind of answers from a linguistic point of view, right? And one day, instead of taking other people's questions, the host asked him, um, Ustad, uh, Professor Salih Rai, you wanted to talk about an ayah you, you mentioned there was an ayah that you were thinking about for a couple of years. And he said, yeah, there's an ayah I've been thinking about for about two years. And he said, what ayah is it? And he said, لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. And the host of the show was like, ما المشكل في هذا يا سيدي? What's the big deal in this ayah? What's the, where's the difficulty? And then he starts explaining, if you were to move anything over, in any way, how the perfection of this phrase would be lost. And he was just, it's mesmerized by how, how Allah multiple times in the Qur'an says لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون Now, I want to go on the other side You know, there's such a thing called consistency in Qur'anic language You could say لا خوف عليهم ولا حزن عليهم They have no fear on them, they have no sadness on them That would have been kind of the same phrase twice over Allah didn't say that Well, what would it mean? What would it mean that they have no sadness on them? Well, if somebody's thrown into jail and their family's crying Does a crying help? No. Even if, some, if somebody's being thrown into hellfire and there are other people crying, oh no, please don't barbecue. Like if that's happening, how is that helping your cause? It doesn't. Actually, if Allah said, La huznun alayhim, it wouldn't help you any. It wouldn't help you any. Sadness is, it doesn't help you if other people are feeling sad for you. If other people are afraid for you and they're concerned about you, they'll do something. But if they're sad for you, it's already too late. <laughs> that's already too late. So what, is being, what, is, what relief is the believer being given? They're not the ones that are going to feel sadness. Actually, feeling sadness is the ultimate pain. As opposed to feeling fear. Feeling fear can even be healthy. But feeling sadness is a very painful thing. It's a very powerful, difficult experience in, in, in life. As a matter of fact, it can even rival or surpass physical pain. That's how bad sadness can become. And so Allah Azza wa Jalla says, they're not going to be the ones that are going to experience sadness. Notice Allah says, لا هم يحزنون الإثبات على غير الفاعل Another technical Arabic principle. Instead of saying, لا يحزنون, they won't be sad. No, no, no. They're not the ones that are going to be sad. Almost saying in parentheses, there are others that are going to be sad. Not them. 
they're, they're going to actually experience joy, but there are others who are going to be experiencing sadness. This is a little bit about لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون. I want to wrap this discussion up with just one, one reminder to you once again. Allah Azza wa did not deny that fear won't happen ever. Allah didn't deny that. All Allah denied is that there won't be ever any real danger on the believer. They will be, their deeds, their relationship with Allah, their guidance will kept, be kept safe so long as they show loyalty to Allah. And they will be relieved from true sadness. You know, I, I give this as a sincere bit of advice to everybody in the room. Allah Azza wa Jal created human beings in difficulty. Human, in this life, there will be some kind of difficulty. Some of you are going to go through financial difficulty. Some of you are going, going to go through physical health difficulty. Some of you are going to go through emotional difficulty. That difficulty will come from people around you, your loved ones, your friends, your siblings, your spouse, your, your, your children, your parents, your grandparents, your uncle. There's going to be people in your life that are very close to you and there's no escape from those people because they're a part of your life and they're going to bring you a lot of grief. And they have before and they continue to some of, th some of them. And there are certain problems in your life that have stuck with you for a very long time. There are people in the room that have been looking for a job for years, can't find. There are people in the room that are being buried under debt. Like they've just loan after loan after loan. They're crushed under debt. And it eats away at them. There are people in the room that have had health condition. Or are taking care of somebody in their family who has a health condition. These are not s small things to deal with. This is a very difficult thing, to trauma to, to experience. But when Allah says, لا هم يحزنون Allah is saying something about His guidance. Remember yesterday I told you how He takes the most sad experiences and turns them into moments of joy? Allah in His Qur'an, when He says, شِفَاءُ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ It is healing for what lies inside of the chest. Allah is telling us that one of the most powerful ways you and I are going to be able to cope with our sadness. Our sadness may not disappear. Well, we're going to be able to cope with it. We're going to be able to deal with it. We're going to be able to get past it and we're not going to allow it to paralyze us. And what is going to help us is the word of Allah. The guidance of Allah. The guidance of Allah actually strengthens the heart of a believer. The guidance of Allah actually gives you the emotional strength to be able to go through difficult times which other people who don't have this guidance, they choose to just down an entire bottle of aspirin and end it. You know? Or they choose to just get drunk and get on the highway and end it. Or jump off a bridge and end it. But when people have iman, they're in a different category. I love telling the story of a friend of mine who uh, in Louisiana, I'll, I'll be brief about it, because some of you may have heard, it, heard me talk about it before. It's such an inspiration. This family in Louisiana, they lived in Baton Rouge, and they, uh, in New Orleans actually, and they had uh, car dealerships. And their car dealership was right on the water, beautiful, luxury cars. You know? And then Hurricane Katrina came back in the day. You remember Katrina? And, they, and they, this was like a religious family, no bank loans, no interest, no nothing. Everything was cash. And the, the, the waters rise and all of the cars are gone in just overnight. They're done. The only car left was a Lexus LS 400, I think it was, 450 or something. It's the only car left. And that's the one they escaped in. You know? And when I went to visit them a year later, he used to deliver pizza in that car. Like dad, mom, everybody was just working in a pizza place, or, you know. And these are people that were living in, they were making like half a million dollars of sales easy a month. Easy. And from there, they're like working at a pizza. They don't own the pizza place, they're working at the pizza place. The whole family, you know. And, you know, if anybody else went through that, like from millions to nothing, what happens to them? You know what happens to them, right? Yeah, they're willing to commit suicide or they get institutionalized. They can't take the loss. This is too much to bear. And yet, the whole family, I've never seen like brighter smiles. I've just never seen brighter smiles. And I even asked one of them, what is it? Why are you guys so happy? You guys went through all this like stuff. They're like, you know, when, we were, when, when business was good, it was good. But this client calls, this delivery is late, this shipment is, is coming, taxes are due, payroll, this, that, the other. I never had time to go to the masjid. And now, we just have work, and we can hear the adhan, we go pray. There's still a roof over our head, there's still food on the table. Life is much more peaceful. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> like, you can't have that if you don't have guidance. You can't have that. There are people who will just cry and lament. They'll drive by the drowned dealership every day. <laughs> like, that's what they'll do. <laughs> you know? They just moved on. 
and not just moved on, they're grateful to Allah for giving them, for still giving them rizq and giving them halal rizq. That's iman. That's actually you're you're being saved from a kind of sadness that for other people will kill them, will destroy them. They won't even be able to stand up anymore. And yet here you are. This is you know from tabi'a hudaya fala khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahsanun. Then on the contrast, what I want to share with you is something very powerful. First, I'll translate the ayah. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ And those who've disbelieved and called our miracles a lie, those are the companions of the fire, those are the people of the fire in which they will remain. They are going to remain only in that fire permanently. هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ So it seems on the one hand, whoever follows the guidance is saved from fear, danger, and sadness, and on the other hand, there are people who do two crimes. They disbelieved and called the miracles a lie. Ayat They called our miracles a lie, uh, and considered them all lies. Then those are the people that are going to be, you know, uh, uh, people of the fire in which they will remain. The first contrast that you'll notice here, which is very important to notice, is that when Allah spoke about guidance, it's as though the, you, I want you to think about two gates visually. Two gates. One gate is for the ayah that offers guidance. The other gate is for the ayah that talks about people who reject the guidance. The gate for the people who are offered guidance is way big. And the gate for the people who reject the guidance is very small. It's narrow. Where am I, where am I getting this from? The first thing you'll notice is one ayah begins, Man, man tabi'ahudaya. Man means open-ended whoever. Whoever. When you say whoever, is that a limited invitation or open invitation? There's a big, wide open invitation. But when you say, وَالَّذِينَ as opposed to man kafara wa kathaba. He didn't say man again. If he said man kafara, whoever disbelieved, then that would be a big wide open invitation again. Rather, he changes the word, a different ism mosul, the more specific, narrow, targeted ism mosul, walladina kafaru, and particularly those who've disbelieved. As though those who've disbelieved are actually a narrow, targeted group of people. He's not saying, oh, just anybody. And it's not just those who've disbelieved or been ungrateful. Add to that, وَكَذَّبُوا كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا And they didn't just stop at disbelieving, they went out of their way to call the miracles we sent them a lie. Now notice, there are two things that come from Allah. First, in the previous ayah, it was huda, it was guidance. In this ayah, it's not huda, it's ayatina. You would expect... Those who accept the guidance, those who reject the guidance. So the same word huda should be used. So it should be وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِهُدَايَ أَوْ بِالْهُدَى Or bihi even, because huda is already mentioned. But he doesn't say huda, he says ayatina. There's a difference. What is guidance? And Allah said any guidance, right? إِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا Any guidance. Any guidance is like Yusuf is sitting in prison. There's a couple of prisoners sitting with him. They're like, hey, we heard you're pretty good at interpreting dreams. He says, yeah, I want to tell you about the dream. But let me tell you something. I've decided to worship just one God because that's the legacy of my father and his father and his father. He didn't give them a long lecture. It was just like two minutes, one minute. Do you think lots of gods are better or just one? That's hudan. It's not an entire book. It's not the entire Torah that he recited onto them. You know, it hasn't even come yet, <laughs> you know. It's not, it's not exhaustive guidance, it's just some snippet, look, just worship one God, don't worship multiple gods. Simple, small thing. But when you say ayat, when you say ayat, you're not just talking about advice or counsel or guidance. You're talking about miracles. Miracles. And Allah doesn't just send miracles right away. Allah gives guidance and guidance and guidance and guidance and guidance and people reject it and reject it and reject it and reject it and finally to convince the people as the final case to be made, Allah also sends miracles. And then when He sends miracles, if people still reject the guidance, then He punishes them. This sunnah of Allah, you guys have to nail it into your heads. It has to be so understood. Why and when does Allah destroy nations? Because if you don't understand this, you might think, oh Allah just loves destroying nations. Every time I read a story, here's the story of Nuh alayhi salam. The kid at Sunday school goes, wait a second. Right, let me tell you what happened. He preached, they didn't listen, he destroyed them. Okay, fine. Let me tell you the story of Salih. The kid goes, hold on a second. He preached, the people didn't listen. Let me get, wait, wait it's coming, it's coming. He destroyed them. <laughs> Seems like Allah just sends messengers to what? Destroy nations. This is when you don't understand. You don't have the right thought process. You don't realize what's going on. Allah Azza wa Jal sent messengers to nations. Think of it like a building that is about to fall. Nations that were so evil, they were about to fall. 
And as they were about to fall, Allah decides, no, I will not let them fall. I will send them someone who can try to what? Straighten it up. So he would send them messengers. These messengers would come and say, listen, straighten out your act. You guys are headed for what? You're headed for destruction. Don't destroy yourselves. I'm here to try to save you. I'm here to try to help you. And he would try to help them and try to help them. And Allah would not destroy the nation so long as the messenger is there. He's the only one trying to help them. And they're so hell-bent, they even try to kill who? That messenger. They insult him, they ridicule him, they don't listen to him. And now they try to kill him too. That's what they did in many cases. And what Allah does, before they even try to kill, some of them they tried to kill. But what Allah does is, fine, if you're not going to listen to this advice, let me show you something so convincing that once you see it, there's no argument left that I'm trying to tell you for your own good that you need to listen. Those were miracles. Miracles were only handed as the last resort before you guys are just a lost cause. So when Allah sends a miracle, that actually means these people have reached the final stage of cancer. That's the last resort. If Allah shows these people a miracle, whether it's the miracle of Salih salam, or it's the nine signs of Musa salam, whatever miracle Allah shows. Once Allah shows a miracle, and they still reject, then this is actually the second thing they've rejected, not the first. What's the first thing they rejected? The guidance. The second thing re they reject is what? The miracle. You with me so far? If they reject the miracle, they have proven that they are a lost cause. At this point, Allah says, fine, you will head down the path you wanted to go all along. I will let you go. And that's when that nation is what? Destroyed. Okay. Now here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing. The Prophet ﷺ preached the Qur'an. The Quraysh said, come on. Show us a miracle. Show us a miracle. And they kept saying, show us something landing from the sky. Why don't you turn this mountain into gold? I'll be convinced. Why don't you bring my dead grandfather back to life and he can tell me that, yep, there is a life after death and he can die again, then I'll be good. I'm so a believer in the afterlife then. The Prophet ﷺ kept saying to them, they're, they're rushing to bring a miracle and Allah, you know how Allah describes it? يَسْتَعْجِلُونَكَ بِالْعَذَابِ They're rushing you to bring about punishment. Allah doesn't say, they're rushing you to bring about the miracle. Allah says they're rushing you to bring about the punishment. Why? Because once you bring the miracle, what have people done historically? Did the miracle help most people or no? No. سُكِّرَتْ أَبْصَارُنَا بَلْ نَحْنُ قَوْمُ مَسْحُرُونَ When people saw the most amazing things, they said, our eyes must be drunk. That can't be real. No, 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 he did some kind of magic. They'd still reject it. And if you're still going to reject it, then your punishment is guaranteed. In this ayah, Allah is not just talking about the rejection of guidance. That's phase one. He's talking about the people, not only who disbelieved, but they, and they call the guidance a lie. They call the miracles of Allah a lie. كَذَّبُوا bi ayatina. Is this much more specific? Isn't it? Compare this to what Allah said about guidance. Whoever follows it. Whoever follows it, in whatever capacity. He didn't even specify what following. Here, disbelieved, call the miracles a lie. Those, ula'ika ashabun nar. Ula'ika is a very particular pointer. If you say, hum ashabun nar, that's a pronoun. A pronoun means they. Now, again, sensitivity to language. You know, in the English language, we say they, and we can say those. They and those. The word they, they could be here, they could be anywhere. But when I say those guys, those is a pointing word. When you point at someone, there's a very targeted specific group that towards you whom you're pointing. If Allah said, Hum ashabun nar, that's actually any they. But if he has a ulaika ashabun nar, he's pointing at a very particular group of people. What I'm trying to show you is the door to guidance is wider and wider and wider open, and the gates to hell are narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow in the Quran. So beautiful. Ulaika ashabun nar. Hum fiha khalidun, in which they will remain. You know, on this note, this is the last comment I'll share with you, then we'll go into the, uh, Danish will be ready, inshallah, we're going to go into the slides soon. Uh, notice also when I said, when the people, good people were being talked about in the previous ayah, Allah said, uh, there's no fear and no grief. Remember that? Is that, did Allah say there's no fear and grief in this world or in the next world, or He didn't specify? He didn't specify, which means it can apply here and it can apply there. If he doesn't say, it's open-ended. But when it came to the disbelievers, did he specify 
Or did he say, I'll punish them here and there? He said, Ula'ika ashabu annar. Annar is here or there? It's over there. So even the punishment is restricted. He'll even give them rizq here. He'll provide them, furnish them here. The disbeliever, he'll furnish him here. He'll give them here too. This is the rahmah of Allah. When it came to guidance and benefits of guidance, dunya and akhirah. When it came to punishment, specifically akhirah. It's a beautiful, beautiful Qur'an that we believe in. It's so, so beautiful. So I was going to share with you from Surah Al-Zumar, and then we'll go to those slides, inshallah. Um, in Surah Al-Zumar, Allah describes groups of people that are entering heaven, and groups of people that are entering hell. And, you know, hell and heaven have gates, okay? Hell and heaven both have gates. So Allah describes as large contingents of people approach the gates of heaven. He says, وَفُتِحَتْ حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا wa wa فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا Which translates, at the very moment, until the very moment they approach it, while its gates were open. While its gates were open. You know what that means, right? I came to this house while the gate, while the door was open. What does that mean? The door was already? Oh, it's been open. It's been open. And when does a door get left open when the host is waiting for the guests eagerly to show up and he doesn't want the guests to even wait a little bit? So the door is kept what? Open. And by the way, the shuhada, the people who are martyred in this, for the sake of Allah, the people who earn a halal living, من قتل دون ماله, someone who earns a, a, a decent fair living, a, you know, a per permissible living, and they're killed, they're mugged and they're killed, they're also considered a shaheed. And a shaheed goes straight into... Jannah, well, how do they get access into Jannah? Because the door is always held open. Mufattahatan lahumul abwaab, yaqul subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doors that are being held wide open already. Contrast this with hell. He says they approach the gates of hell. Hatta idha ja'uha futihat abwaabuha. Lam yuqul wa futihat abwaabuha. He says until they reach the gates, then the doors are opened. He doesn't say while the doors were open. The wow is missing. Describing that the gates of hell are kept what? Closed. closed. Until the people get there, then he'll open them. Like the prison, whose gates are kept closed until the inmate shows up, then, and he's let in and, that's it. What a contrast between heaven and hell in the Quran. From every little word. And these are the kinds of things sometimes, you know, I read in translation, and it just like, I almost like, blah. Where is it? What? There's a why there, there's no why here. Why are you translating it the same? And then people say, I love this translation, man. It's the best translation. I was like, it's Ramadan, not going to say anything. You know, which translation do you recommend? I can't. I have a hard time. Because when things like this are overlooked, there's a big problem. It gives a different picture of the Quran. You know? So now, inshallah, now that we've reached the conclusion of this story, Adam alayhi salam is being told, whoever follows my guidance will have the benefits of no fear and grief. And you know, no fear on them and no grief. And the, those who reject it and lie against our miracles, Allah is already telling us, Allah won't just give us guidance, He will also give us miracles. By the way, the Qur'an is one of these two things. Guidance and miracles. It's guidance and It's the first time both of them were made together, yeah? But both of them were put together. So both of those are separated in those two ayat. Now that the story comes to an end, I'd like you to show the slide, inshallah. If you guys can look at the screen, I will walk you through the entire story. It's some funny colors. Uh, can you see it yet, guys? Okay, you can see it yet. Okay. So, listen to me as you look at this. Don't try to figure it out yourself. Just listen. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً When the angel, Allah said to the angels, I'm going to put what on the earth? A khalifa on the earth. Okay. And they said, you're going to put someone who's going to do what? You remember? He's going to cause corruption. He's going to spill blood. And Allah said to them, إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That's the next part. It says, I know what you don't know. إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Then Allah says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Adam, Allah taught Adam the names, all kinds of names of people, of things. And then He presented those people before, and those things before the angels. And what did He say to the angels? Tell me these names, if you're telling, إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ if, if you're telling the truth. What did they say? قَالُوا سُبْحَانَكَ لَا عِلْمَ لَنَا إِلَّا مَا عَلَّمْتَنَا how perfect you are. We have no knowledge whatsoever except whatever you've taught us. I've summarized that here as we know absolutely nothing. You see that in the middle? Then you go on. Then 
Tell them, Adam, tell them the names of these things. That's the next ayah. We go on with the subject. And when he tell, told them the names of those things, Allah turned back to the angels and said, Didn't I tell you I know the secrets, the unseen of the skies and the earth? And I know what you show and what you expose. And then finally Allah said to the angels, We said to the angels, make sajda to Adam. And what did they do? They made sajda, all of them with the exception of Iblis. Right? So that's the first half of the story. You'll notice something. The first thing Allah said was, angels, I'm going to put a khalifa on the earth. And what was their reaction? What was their reaction when he said, I'm going to put a khalifa? Not a good idea. Uh, we have an issue, we have two issues, facade on the earth and spilling blood. Remember that? By the end of the same story, he told the angels again. This time he didn't just say, I'm putting a khalifa. What did he say? Make sajda. But this time, instead of having an issue, what did they do? They made sajda immediately. So the subject is actually completed. The first time they were addressed, the last time they were addressed, in the beginning and the end of this half of the story. The second subject was, I know what you don't. Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. And towards, the, if you work backwards, Allah says, didn't I tell you I know? You see how the same subject is repeating itself? It, co it, it co corresponds perfectly. Then the third thing was, Allah taught Adam alayhi salam all the names. And then the third last thing was, Adam, why don't you tell them how you know all the names? And right in the middle, the heart of the story, this is the first half of the story, right in the middle, what is it? The principle that all people must remember, Subhanaka, how perfect you are. La ilma lana illa ma allamtana. We have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever, except what you've taught us. Innaka anta al-alimul hakim. You're the only one that is the ultimately knowing, the ultimate owner of all wisdom. That is the heart of the story. Notice how this half of the story is perfectly symmetrical. You see it? Now we move on to the second half of the story. Listen to as I, as I speak. فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ They all made sajda except? Iblis. أَبَا وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ He refused and he was arrogant, he was full of pride. He sought greatness for himself and he was of those who denied. Then Allah says, Ya Adam, uskun anta wa zawjuka al-janna. Adam, settle down yourself your spouse in heaven, all throughout heaven. And don't go near what? لا تقرب هذه الشجرة Don't go near this tree. فتكون من الظالمين Then Allah says, فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا Shaitan made them slip. And then the command came. What, what command came when they slipped? اِهْبِطُوا <laughs> Descend. بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوا You're going to be enemies to each other. And you're going to have a temporary place to stay in the world. And some time to enjoy. Then Allah says, yesterday we talked about it. فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Then Adam came into contact with words from his master. Through those words, what did he do? He repented. And Allah accepted his repentance. إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Then Allah says again, قُلْ نَهْبِطُوا مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا he says to them, descend from here all together. Whenever guidance comes to you, there's no fear on them. They won't be the ones grieving. That's what we just did today. No fear and no grief. You see it right there. And then finally Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَيْكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Those who disbelieve and you know, call our miracles a lie, those are the people of fire in which they will remain. Now notice this half of the story, it began with shaitan rebelling. And it ends with people who deserve hellfire because they follow who? Because they follow shaitan. It began with Adam السلام, being in a place where there's no fear and no sadness. Where was he? Jannah. In Jannah. And it ends with Allah saying, if you follow my guidance, you'll get a glimpse of Jannah. No fear and no sadness. And then the third issue Allah said to them was, come down from here. You'll be enemies to each other. And on the flip side, he told them, come down again, but follow my guidance. So come down was mentioned twice. And right in the middle is the heart of this passage. When a human being makes mistakes, what should they do? They should, make, they should find the words from Allah and make tawbah. So the heart of the first half is we have to accept we don't know everything. And the heart of the second half is we have to make tawbah. How beautiful is that? Now what, I, what, you've, what I've shown you thus far is that the story is two halves. One half you can say Adam and the angels. The second half is Adam and... Iblis, right? Two perfect halves. And each of them are perfectly symmetrical. Before I even go any further, do you notice a remarkable level of organization of ideas in the Qur'an? Like symmetrical st structuring in the Qur'an. When you and I teach something, when we do like, a, a, like I'm doing a lecture, I've talked about like a lot of things. 
And I'm not doing it off, like I have some ayat in front of me, but I don't have, I'm going to say this sentence first, then I'm going to say this sentence, and of the five sentences, number one and number five will correspond, and number two and number four will correspond, and three will be right in the middle, and three is the heart of what I want to get at. I don't possess the mental capacity to speak in that way. I don't. The Qur'an continuously speaks in this way. To a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who does not know how to read or write, and then these people have the audacity to say the Qur'an doesn't seem organized. The, like Hamiduddin Farahi said, the one who organized every tip of your fingers, he organized every bone in your body, didn't organize his own book? What are you, what are you thinking? You're the ones who don't recognize the organization. You didn't reflect. But when you reflect, the, the level of organization in the Qur'an is absolutely mind-boggling. If you could take them to the next slide, please, I want to show you guys something. This you won't understand right away, let me explain it to you, okay? You see five boxes there. There's two blue boxes on the left side, there's two black boxes on the right side, and there's a white box in the middle. That much is clear. I hope you're not colorblind. If that you are, in the, I apologize for my insensitivity. Okay, now, the surah began, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ الْعَرَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبُ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ The first blue box represents the first subject of the surah, which was what? Believers. The next was, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا and وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ Those who disbelieve and those who aren't truly believers, they just pretend to be. The believers and the dis disbelievers and the hypocrites, they're all bunched together. That's your first black box. You with me? Then the third passage was, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ عُبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ People, worship your master. The one who made this earth for you as a bed and the sky as a canopy. That was our third section. That's the white one in the middle. Then started the story of Adam alayhi salam, which I just told you is broken up into how many parts? Two parts. What are the two parts? Adam, Iblis. Adam and Iblis. So you'll notice, the two things on the left are what? Believers and angels. Believers and angels, because they're both believers. And what are the two things on the right? Disbelievers and the devil, because they're both disbelievers. They're already corresponding this side to this side, that side to that side. Then we go a step further. You'll notice that on, this, on, the, on the left side where you have you know, Adam السلام, and the angels. Allah began the Qur'an by saying this book has absolutely no what? Good. This book has absolutely no doubt. Now let me take you to the story of Adam السلام. Adam السلام was created. Allah Azzawajal brought him before the angels. And the angel said, we're not so sure. We have some doubts. We have some doubts. We think he's going to spill blood. We think he's going to be corrupt. And Allah sh provided them evidence. He showed them that the human being is far beyond what they imagined. And so their doubts were removed and they fell into sajda. This is the parallel with Rasulullah There could be people living in Medina who, are, who don't know the Prophet They hear the man claims to be a messenger and obviously when you hear somebody claims to be a prophet and their book is the book of God, your first reaction is you will have what? You will have doubts. And then you will explore and once you are furnished with the evidence, you have, will have no choice but to what? fall into sajda, there are multiple places in the Qur'an where you find believers, people who came from different religions, they heard the word of Allah, sujadan. They fell on their faces in sajda. Their reaction was sajda, when they realized the evidence of the Qur'an. So the, the, just like the angels needed evidence so they could fully submit to this commandment, it's the same thing. There are going to be people, people of the book, non-Muslims, agnos, seekers, when they're provided that evidence, their reaction will actually be similar to that of the angels. They will have questions, just like the angels had questions, but this book will remove all of those doubts and they will fall into sajda. And they're, they're going to come, subhanAllah. So that's that parallel on this side. Now if you look on the other side, what did Allah say about Iblis? Did he have evidence? He did. He had the same evidence that was given to everybody. But somehow his heart was filled with what? With pride, so much pride that he wasn't even willing to listen to the direct command of Allah. Direct command of Allah. Aba wa wa kana min al kafirin. And if you look at the parable of the, the, the hypocrites and the disbelievers, Allah said, Allah sealed their hearts and their hearing and their eyes, no matter what they see, no matter what evidence they see, no matter what commandment they hear, their hearts are so filled with pride, they won't accept any of it. 
So a parallel is made between the devil and his reaction to the kuffar of Mecca and then the, 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 the leadership, the intellectual leadership of the Jewish community in Medina who refused the Prophet ﷺ even after knowing the truth, they're being parallel together, subhanAllah. The additional parallel is if you study other places in Qur'an, do you know what the problem of Iblis was? Why didn't he want to accept the Prophet ﷺ? Why didn't he want to accept Adam ﷺ? خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينٍ You made me from fire. You made him from clay. You made him from dirt. Interesting. If Allah says, why, what kept you from doing sajda? Which means you have a problem with him. You don't want to acknowledge him. You should begin with, you made him from dirt. He didn't. He started with himself. He said, you made me from fire. Homie, why are you starting with yourself? We all know what you're made of. Why'd you begin with yourself? He felt overlooked. He's like, not only is he made of dirt, that's a secondary issue. The big problem here is I made a fire. And I got overlooked. <laughs> Obsessed with himself. This is his kibr. This is his kibr. And that's why you'll find for disbelievers, adabun azim, great punishment, because they think of themselves as great. Anyway. The, the, the Israelites of Medina, the Jewish community, the rabbis in particular of Medina, what was the basis for them you know, not accepting the Prophet ﷺ? He's not of the Jewish people. He's not an Israelite. He's a Gentile. Moreover, he's from the cursed lineage of Ishmael. He's an Arab. How can we accept an Arab as a prophet? Those are barely human. We're supposed to accept him as a prophet? It is exactly the same problem as who? Iblis who says, I'm made of fire. He's, I'm made of a superior material. I have superior genetics. Therefore, I cannot accept him. It is exactly the same problem. And so in the structure of the surah, these two things are parallel. Now what's left is right in the heart of it, right in the middle. What is in the middle? Ya ayyuhan nas u'budu rabbakum. People, enslave yourselves to your master. And notice in the beginning, and so this, I'm talking about the white box now, okay? That white box began with Allah reminding us that He made the, the, the earth and the skies. And it also ended by reminding us that He made the earth and the skies. Which is amazing because the first, the top two boxes are what went on on the earth. And the bottom two boxes are a story of what happened where? In the skies. And Allah says, worship the master who made the skies and the earth. And then what he, would, what he put right in the middle. Let's see, if you understand this, then what is the central passage so far? What is the middle of the entire narrative so far? People worship your man. That passage, yeah? Then the question becomes, what is the middle of that passage? What is the middle of the middle? The middle of the middle is, وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Congratulate the believers that those who believe and do good deeds, that they're going to have gardens, the bottoms of which rivers are going to be flowing. Every time they're given a fruit, they're going to say, this is kind of like what we used to be given before. It will look similar to them, and they'll have purified spouses, and they'll stay in it forever. That long ayah is a description of what? Of Jannah. Now what is Jannah? Why is Jannah in the middle? You were being given guidance, so you can come back to Allah. People who rejected guidance, whose hearts were sealed, Allah said about them, فَهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ They're not going to come back. Come back where? To their original home. What's their original home? Jannah. 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 Then you find, why would that be your original home? Yeah, because you started there, and that's why the rest of the story is actually what took place in Jannah. Everything so far, the call is for humanity to make their way back to heaven. That's the call. SubhanAllah. So, so beautiful. Do you know that in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah describes Jannah as follows, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Those people are the inheritors. Those who will inherit the highest levels of heaven, in which they will remain. Heaven is called an inheritance. When is an inheritance given? When it belonged to your father and it's passed down to you. You see why it's called inheritance? Our father was there. And we are now, we are inheritors of that heaven. We have to qualify ourselves back to claim the property that Allah named for the father and his lineage. And all of them, subhanAllah. That is the uh, kind of a structural overview 
of the surah thus far and from here inshallah ta'ala we begin what seems like a completely unrelated subject the Israelites that's what we're going to go into tomorrow bi idhnillah but as as you probably already guessed it's not unrelated it seems that way it's profoundly related but we'll talk about that bi idhnillah ta'ala tomorrow it's we're going to start with a very interesting question tomorrow uh, is there such a thing as inherited sin in Islam is there such a thing as your father's committed a sin, therefore you're held responsible? And if there isn't such a thing, then why do we hate the Jews so much, so, so many of us? Because when we, when we express our disgust with the Jewish people, some Muslims, then they actually cite, look at the Qur'an and what it said about them when they did this, 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 this. But what you're quoting is what not they did, but what their ancestors did thousands of years ago. And now you're using that to justify your anger towards your Jewish neighbor and your, you know, the, the, the Jew, Jewish people altogether, we're going to address that issue directly, inshallah ta'ala. How does the Qur'an, does the Qur'an blame even the Jews of Medina? The Jews of Medina are not the Jews of Musa alayhi salam. What they did and what these people did, they're two different things. So how do we reconcile that? How do we understand that properly? Because I do believe this is one of the sicknesses that is affecting, and like a virus, infecting the minds of Muslims today. They don't know how to think about non-Muslims. We don't understand how the Qur'an wants us to think about non-Muslims, particularly the Jewish people and by extension others. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us clear understanding in light of His book and remove our biases and the only bias we want within our hearts is the bias of Allah's word. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.